Welcome to worship. I have um, very few announcements this morning. We're trying to kind of get ourselves uh, in gear for the fall, trying to adjust to our ongoing reality of not being able to gather indoors, not being able to do fellowship activities, just trying to turn a series of knots into a series of cans. So we're, we're working on that. Uh, the only announcement I would have is that um, if, you have, if you know of a youth who is confirmation age, uh, Lynn and Amy Bush are forming a con the co Falls Confirmation class. So um, just have them be in touch with either Amy Bush or Lynn Fay or the office. We'll be able to get you in touch with who you need to talk to. Um, with that said, does anyone have anything to mention? Then let us compose ourselves for worship. So there, <laughs> we are at worship, right? <laughs> Please rise as you're comfortably able and let us join in the call to worship. No one is an island. We are all joined in Christ Jesus. No one lives by themselves. No one dies by themselves. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Our first hymn this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy.
God's spirit into our midst. God of wisdom, help us to understand your wisdom. Enlighten us that we may grow in the knowledge of your truth, that we may worship and serve you. Enlighten us that we may be one body, rejoicing that we can be both teacher and student, even as we undertake to both teach and learn your wisdom and truth. Amen. Please be seated. So it came to my attention that we have some youth, some children, who are watching us on Facebook Live and YouTube. And I thought, well, for crying out loud, it may be about time I spoke to them. And not only that, but we were in the coffee hour last Tuesday, and the conversation came up that there are people, and I heard this from a confirmation student and a couple of adults elsewhere, there are people who say, you know what? I learned more in the children's message than I learned from the sermon. I thought, you know, I have heard that before. So we're going to be talking about the armor of God today. And the armor of God, when you think of armor, you think of swords and you think of gloves, halberds, swords, you think of shields, and yet when you look at these, what you see are weapons of destruction. You see things that can cause harm. You also see things that can keep people from harming you, as in the shield. But either way, what you see and what you think of, even if you're a kid with armor, is war and attacking. And then we think, okay, so when Pastor Paul perhaps wrote that letter to the Ephesians, was he really talking about this? Was he really talking about that shield, that armor, that defense and offense, that attack? And you know, I'm not sure, I don't think that he was. I think if I had kids up here with me, I think the kids who are maybe at home are saying, no, Pastor Vicki, I don't think that's what he's talking about. So let's think about putting that down. Let's think about what happens if we put a sword down. We can't really attack anybody anymore, right? And when we put this shield down, suddenly it feels like we can't defend ourselves anymore. And when we take our glove off, suddenly we're in a position to reach out to someone else. So when Paul is talking about the armor of God, I think he may be talking about, perhaps he talks about the feet of peace, put on whatever footwear is comfortable to you as you go out and seek peace. Well, peace is pretty hard to find. So when we put on shoes that fit the best, suddenly our feet are just comfortable. And that's what peace might be, is that feeling of comfort that you get. And then when it Paul will talk about the sword of the spirit when I read scripture. And I think what he's talking about there might just be the golden rule. Because we hear that as one of Christ's most important teachings is the golden rule. Do to others as you would have it done to you. That one's really hard to live with. That one's really hard to think about. And then there's, let's see which one else we have. We, we have the breastplate of righteousness. Paul will talk about the breastplate of righteousness. And righteousness is a big word. And basically what that means is I know in my heart that I'm doing the right thing. That's righteousness. So we have the concept 
We have the idea of doing the right thing. We have the idea of being at peace, of being comfortable with our neighbors, and we have the golden rule. Those, those are the things that God gives us as our armor. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the teachings of Jesus. We thank you for the teachings of all of the people, the wise folks who came after him. We thank you for the folks that founded the first churches as they sat in a house together, eating and sharing the wisdom that they had learned from, the, from Jesus and from Paul and from all of the folks who followed down through the ages. And we thank you for that very simple rule that is so hard to live, the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Let that be our armor. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. Our first reading this morning is from Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, and search it for all hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the ways of his faithful ones. And from that letter to the congregation in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, 
Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and of flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on that breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make room, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, let's first recall that this letter to the congregation in Ephesus was written long before Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. In the Apostle Paul's time, Christians were an odd Jewish sect, assuming that you'd even heard of them as those followers of the way were known. Their Jewish parent had pretty much disowned them because of that claim that Jesus was the Messiah. And as a general rule, they were harassed and they were discriminated against and they had zero power or influence. So, I think our writer may have been being just a little bit ironic as he suggests that the recipients of this letter put on the whole armor of God or any kind of armor at all. Obviously, it's a metaphor. And I would compare it to those two processions that were coming into Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. One procession is all glittering armor worn by trained Roman soldiers on war horses, and the other was, well, it was peasants waving palm branches, welcoming a man on a donkey. There's no contest here. And this is the point. Man to man, person to person, these Jesus followers didn't have a chance. Well, Jesus flipped the narrative first, with Paul and his followers picking up the theme as they spread the word. If you want to turn the tables on injustice, oppression, and evil, well, this is how you armor up. Your most powerful protection is the truth. So that's first. Righteousness, nonviolence, and faith, those are good gear to have, and eventually, The world's salvation will be the result. And the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, the power of the Holy Spirit is the only weapon these anti-warriors, we anti-warriors, need. This is a new reality. Unfortunately, this new reality lost its way a bit when Christianity was legalized in 325, And it got worse when Christianity became the state religion of Rome in 380. A lot of blood has been spilled since then, as opposing believers have fought over who Jesus was. Jews, Muslims, Eastern Christians have been killed, the enslavement of Africans, all justified somehow in Christ's name. If God looked like us, I can only imagine him shaking his head in amazement at how the message of the gospel of peace could be so, so misunderstood. 
Yet, yet, in the midst of the carnage, there have always been those with their spiritual armor on. George Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, spoke out against slavery way back in the 1600s. In Mainz and Cologne in the 1100s, Christians managed to protect some Jews from death. That 1839 Amistad incident enshrined in that movie starring Morgan Freeman, well, that's part of our UCC history as our forebears fought for the rights of those African slaves, standing against the tide of public opinion alone with their spiritual armor of God. And then, of course, there was the confessing church in Nazi Germany. The civil rights movement. The civil rights movement has its martyrs, and there's always, there has always been light in the midst of the spiritual darkness, and it is important to remember that, too. Spiritual darkness, evil. That sounds so old-fashioned sometimes, and so really does a concept like the armor of God. If we want to modernize evil, we can call it immorality. We can call it depravity, corruption, or dishonor. There's no doubt in my mind that evil still exists and that we are called to stand against it, whatever we want to call it. And the truth, the truth is still our shield, just as it was for the author of our Proverbs text and just as it was for those people in Ephesus. When we come to church, we come for the same reasons that our ancestors did. We want to hear our history, our traditions, and we want to hear how they speak to today and how they will speak to the future. We want to know what it all means beyond the green altar cloths and the odd furniture. And the truth, the truth is found in Exodus with the call there to protect the alien, the widow, and the orphan in our midst. It's found in Proverbs, guarding the paths of justice. It's found in our words of baptism, which put us all on an equal footing with each other none better or worse than another. It's found in all of our stories. Those stories that we tell here in this sanctuary and the stories that we teach in Sunday school, in vacation Bible school, in confirmation, in our homes, and in our larger community. And I will tell you it's a truth that sometimes makes us squirm just a little uncomfortably because it's not always easy to hear. God's armor sometimes pinches. When Paul tells us to stand firm, he doesn't mean for us to get set in our ways. He tells us to put on as shoes whatever will make us ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Whatever makes us ready. There is a lot of flexibility in that statement. It reminds me of the saying about not judging someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes because everyone's shoes are different, just as each of us are different. It also reminds me that God's steadfast love for his entire creation is the truth that we tell, and it's at the root of every story Jesus told. As a preacher... I particularly like what Len Sweet writes about our stories. The Bible is not a rule book for me, which turns into a lecture series for you, but a divine story about how we can be together in relationship with God, each other, ourselves, and creation. Hear those four things as they come in, our relationship with God and with each other and then ourselves and creation. We are about to start another church year, a year where we can once again make our ears attentive to wisdom and incline our hearts to understanding, as we heard from Proverbs. 
It's especially important to hear this now as we deal with the ongoing issues related to this pandemic. I would normally have had all kinds of announcements about what's coming up, about what we're doing as a church. And we are still doing some things. We still have the little free pantry. We still have mission efforts going on to help those in our community. We still have confirmation. We still have Sunday school. But they don't look the same as they did. We have people out there on live stream and on YouTube that would normally be here in this sanctuary. So we've had to adapt and we've had to continue to adapt. We're trying to figure out how to have an all church gathering outdoors so that we can check in with each other face to face. And there are so many things that at this time last year, we were really hoping that we'd be doing this year. And we're not. And it looks like we're going to have to adapt to this being around for a very long time. So this isn't the short-term sort of thing that we thought it might have been in 2020. But, but, the truth, the truth that has fed us for 2,000 years is still there. We help each other figure out how God's truth works in our lives and how we might share it with others. We look for the wisdom that will help us help our neighbor in our current situation. I heard Dr. Jonathan LaPook in an interview this week saying that it's more important to listen than it is to speak. And with that in mind, maybe we can figure out what size shoes our neighbor is wearing or where our own armor is pinching. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for prayer, we think about so many of those situations in our world that we reflect on and feel the need to just either lament or celebrate, and we name some of those. We name the situation in Afghanistan. We name the situation in Haiti where people are suffering. We pray concerning the wildfires that are not just afflicting our Pacific Northwest, but also affecting Greece and other countries, Siberia even, as smoke covers or reaches the Arctic for the first time in recorded history. We pray for our first lines of defense in this pandemic, our nurses, our doctors, our custodians, our firefighters, our police officers, they are all there on the front lines for us. We pray for all of those who are going back to school, our children and our teachers. We pray for wise leaders, and we pray for all of those names that are listed in our bulletin. And we pray the prayers of our hearts. Let us pause for prayer. Dear God of all, today we pray that we might learn. For those whose titles are teacher and student, and for all of us as we seek to teach and to learn from each other in our turn. As we have talents, may we share them. As we seek wisdom, let us learn. Grant us the humility to learn and the confidence to teach, to be a light in the darkness. Prepare our teachers to welcome and love our children, and may we show them love and respect in return. Give us grace to have the courage to say what needs to be said, tools and knowledge on how and when to speak love and strength when we feel weak. And, dear God, help us to listen to the reply also with love and with grace. Help us to remember that our words always have meaning and that there are some that may be best left unsaid. We are overwhelmed with gratitude for the gift of Jesus' teaching and his welcome of all. 
Bless all of us, God, today. May we see a glimpse of how our faithfulness will impact future generations. We pray all this using the words Jesus taught us in his short time here on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So I wonder how many of you have ever wondered why the doxology follows the offering. Doxology comes from that Greek word, doxologia, meaning words of glory, and it always follows an act of praise. So when we see it this way, we see our offering as an act of praise to God, and it's through this act that we honor God. Let us be generous in our praise to God. Please rise as you're comfortably able. dedicate our offerings. Dear God, you have offered us a place at the table, and you have called us to share without expectation of being repaid. You have called us to make a place for those who have no place. We ask that you bless these resources, that they might support ministries of compassion and justice until all of your children have a place at the table. Amen. And our last hymn this morning is Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. We ground ourselves in the idea of peace. Peace within ourselves, the peace that comes from taking that deep breath and cleansing ourselves. 
and letting that peace flow out from us in words of kindness and compassion, expressing God's steadfast love out in the world. Let's do that this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.